Hi everyone and welcome to today's 10 minute tut on an approach to dysphagia. Dysphagia can be defined as a subjective sensation of difficulty or abnormality in swallowing which may or may not be painful or odynophagic. Dysphagia involves problems in moving food or fluid through the three phases of swallowing, from the mouth to the pharynx, from the pharynx to the esophagus, or through the esophagus to the stomach. Patients with dysphagia will commonly complain of the following symptoms. They might describe having fullness in the throat, such as the sensation of a feeling of a lump in the throat, commonly called the globus, choking on swallowing or food getting stuck with or without excessive salivation. They might have an absolute inability to swallow, or they might describe regurgitation, which is usually effortless and often occurs with achalasia or with reflux. They might have retching or dry heaving, which is when the patient attempts to vomit and may be associated with nausea, but is not actually coming up. And that may be associated with a bolus obstruction. Or the patient could have dysphagia with vomiting, which is active and usually implies a problem lower down with the stomach. In terms of the anatomy, the esophagus starts at the sixth cervical vertebra and is approximately 25 to 28 centimeters long. There's a five centimeter segment in the neck, a one centimeter segment in the diaphragm, and a two to three centimeter segment in the abdomen. The lumen of the esophagus is typically about two centimeters wide. When explaining where lesions are, surgeons generally describe them in relation to the distance from the incisors so that other clinicians can find them on G-scope. There are three classic narrowings of the esophagus. These are normal esophageal constrictions. Some texts might list four, but these are the three classic narrowings. The first one is at the beginning point of the esophagus, at the C6 vertebra. This is typically 15 centimeters from the incisors. The second classical narrowing is the crossing point of the esophagus and the left main bronchus at the carina at the level of T5, and this is typically about 27 centimeters from the incisors. Finally, the gastroesophageal junction, where the esophagus passes through the diaphragm and is roughly 40 centimeters from the incisors. This typically corresponds to the xiphoid process of the sternum and is in line with the T11 vertebra. The normal lumen of the esophagus is 20 millimeters or 2 centimeters. A patient typically needs to have a lumen diameter of greater than 14 millimeters or 1.4 centimeters to be able to swallow reasonably well. When classifying sources of dysphagia, it's helpful to approach it by breaking it down into intraluminal, mural, or extramural sources. Intraluminal sources of dysphagia include a foreign body obstruction, most commonly in children, but in adults it must be investigated further as it may be associated with a functional cause such as achalasia. Patients can also present with esophageal webs associated with iron deficiency anemia and atrophic lysitis in something called Plummer-Vinson syndrome. Mural sources of dysphagia can include neoplasia such as squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, infective causes such as candida or bacterial or viral infections, and benign strictures, often secondary to caustic ingestion such as acids or even a strong alkalis. They may also be post-infective or due to reflux. Another important source of mural dysphagias are the dysmotility disorders, including achalasia, where there's a tight lower esophageal sphincter, and reflux patients may also experience some motility disorders. Extramural sources of dysphagia involve anything outside of the structure of the esophagus pushing in on the esophagus. This can include enlarged lymph nodes due to tuberculosis in the chest, severe hepatomegaly, aneurysms in the aorta, mediastinal tumors or masses, or thyroid enlargement or parathyroid enlargement, especially causing a stricture at the start of the esophagus. Zenker's diverticulum is also an important form of extramural dysphagia. This is where the pharyngeal mucosa herniates through Killian's dehiscence and can be associated with cricopharyngeal dysmotility. Zenker's diverticulum commonly presents with features of dysphagia, regurgitation, and halitosis. Finally, a malignancy in the gastric cardia may cause a pseudoachalasia because this is pushing on the lower esophageal sphincter. When taking a history from a patient presenting with dysphagia, your aim is to determine whether the dysphagia is oropharyngeal or esophageal, which will point to either a functional or a mechanical cause. If a patient has difficulty initiating swallowing, this points to an oropharyngeal problem. But if the patient describes a feeling of food getting stuck after swallowing, this suggests an esophageal problem. Does the patient describe any coughing, choking, or regurgitation of food nasally? 
Aspiration of food is an important complication of dysphagia. Does the patient describe problems with swallowing liquids or just solids? Dysphagia to liquids is typically a motility or neuromuscular cause, whereas dysphagia to just solids suggests a benign or malignant obstruction. If the patient describes dysphagia to solids, then progressing to dysphagia to liquids, this again suggests a benign or malignant obstruction that is increasing in size. It's important to ask how long the difficulty has occurred for. Have the symptoms progressed? Or have they been intermittent? Or have they remained the same? You could ask about associated symptoms. Is there nausea and vomiting? Does the patient have weight loss, heartburn, loss of appetite, regurgitation or vomiting? Or have they been coughing fresh or old blood, which may indicate tracheal invasion? They might have hoarseness of voice, or they might describe chest pain or odonophagia. Finally, does the patient have a history of radiation therapy or a history of caustic ingestion? And of course, carry out relevant histories including things like smoking, alcohol, a family history of malignancy, a history of stroke or Parkinson's which can cause functional defects, diets, infections, other things that can cause esophagitis, or a history of peptic ulcer disease as well. So when examining your patient, you want to look for features such as anemia, which suggests malignancy or blood loss. Look for features of dehydration due to vomiting. They might have jaundice if there's mets to the liver. They might also have voice changes or cachexia. It's important also to do a lymph node exam as well as a thyroid exam. On the patient's vitals, they might show a tachycardia, which may be due to anemia, hypertension, or infection. And they might have tachypnea due to an aspirational pneumonia. That's why it's important to do a respiratory examination. Aspiration of food contents is a common complication resulting in pneumonia, which has a high mortality. Otherwise, patients might have tracheoesophageal fistulas due to malignant invasion. And this typically presents with a spluttering cough with hematemesis. Features which may occur in a patient with pneumonia include decreased vocal fremitus, dullness to percussion, and decreased air entry on one side. On GRT exam, you can palpate a vocal's node if there's malignancy, assess for ascites or hepatomegaly, and don't forget to do a PR to check for melina, which is a feature of occult upper GI bleed. So how would we investigate a patient with dysphagia? At the bedside, we could do an ECG to rule out myocardial infarction, as well as an arterial blood gas to look for features of sepsis or electrolyte derangements due to vomiting. Typically, these patients would be hypokalemic, hypochloremic, and have a metabolic alkalosis. In terms of the laboratory investigations, you'll send away blood for an FBC to look for anemia or for a raised white cell count in infection, as well as a UNE to assess their dehydration from vomiting and possibly assess their fitness for surgery and scopes. So how would we go about imaging a patient with dysphagia? Well, we have three main approaches. The first one is a barium swallow, the second is endoscopy, and the third one is x-rays. A barium swallow is typically the gold standard when it comes to dysphagia because it gives you a roadmap should surgery be required. You can identify perforations or fistulae, and it has the advantage in being less invasive than a scope, especially if you suspect that there might be webs or diverticula in the esophagus where a G-scope might cause perforation. However, if the patient is at high risk of aspiration, a barium swallow can be dangerous. Barium swallows allow for visualization of obstructive lesions. An important feature to look for is the shouldering of a stricture. Benign strictures typically have a smoother contour, whereas malignant strictures form a more right-angled contour. You might also be able to see a bird's beak sign of achalasia lower down, where the tight lower esophageal sphincter causes a very sharp narrowing of the lumen of the esophagus. You might also see visualization of a pharyngeal pouch or an esophageal diverticulum. And in terms of muscular causes of dysphagia, diffuse esophageal spasm gives a corkscrew appearance on barium swallow. Endoscopy approaches include G-scopes or esophagogastroduodenoscopy, or OGD, but you can see why people call it a G-scope. This has the advantage of being both diagnostic and therapeutic. It allows the surgeon to stop bleeding, to do stenting of the esophagus, and to take biopsy to send to the lab. A disadvantage of G-scopes is that they are invasive and they require skill and equipment, and you run the risk of damaging delicate structures or causing a perforation if the tissues are very friable. At the very least, you should do a chest x-ray to assess for consolidation in the case of aspiration pneumonia, and to guide you if a bronchoscopy should be done if tracheal invasion is suspected. One final thing about investigations, 
Do not scope a patient if you suspect that achalasia is the cause because a lavage will be needed to remove all the food that is collected superior or proximal to the low esophageal sphincter. Achalasia will typically show an air fluid level on x-ray, which is again why a chest x-ray is a helpful first step. If achalasia is suspected, the investigation to do there would be manometry, which shows the pressures of the muscles closing at the bottom of the esophagus. So how do we manage a patient with dysphagia? First of all, your basics. Set up an IV line with fluids. The patient might be dehydrated from vomiting and you want to attach monitoring and O2 as needed. Give the patient analgesia if required, as well as antibiotics if you suspect that a pneumonia is present. Don't forget to write up your patient's chronic meds and then treat the cause of the dysphagia. In terms of management of the stricture, it's important to rule out a malignant cause by taking a biopsy and then dilating strictures by a variety of means. This could be balloon dilators or stents, and then any treatment of the underlying reflux. If the patients are resistant to dilatation, there are surgical techniques of resection and reconstruction where the stricture is taken out and the two ends of the esophagus anastomosed to repair. This leads me to talk about esophageal cancer. This may be adenocarcinoma, which typically involves the lower part or lower third of the esophagus and is more common in the setting of Barrett's esophagus or with alcohol or with H. pylori infestation and other risk factors. The patient could have squamous cell carcinoma, which is typically in the middle and upper third of the esophagus. And the most important risk factors here, again, are smoking and alcohol or caustic ingestion, as well as some dietary deficiencies. 70% of esophageal cancers are squamous cell carcinomas and about 30% are adenocarcinomas. In terms of risk factors for esophageal cancer, far and away the most important risk factor is smoking, which shows a 100-fold increased risk for squamous cell carcinoma and a 10-fold increase for adenocarcinoma. Alcohol also gives patients a two times increased risk for esophageal cancer. Other important risk factors are obesity, which is generally related to reflux and increases in adenocarcinoma incidence, and then diet. Patients drinking hot beverages or preserved foods, uh, something called betel nuts, which are typically chewed in East Asia, and vitamin and mineral deficiencies in selenium, vitamin E, and beta-carotene. Barrett's esophagus causes intestinal metaplasia of esophageal mucosa due to reflux, and this carries an increased risk of cancer due to the metaplasia dysplasia carcinoma sequence. The risk of cancer is typically 30 to 40 times higher than in individuals without Barrett's esophagus and is about 1% per year, so it's a very important risk factor. Achalasia is associated with a 2 to 8% incidence of squamous cell carcinoma, and when it comes to caustic injury, remember that this typically occurs where the strictures or the narrowings of the esophagus are, mostly in the middle third of the esophagus and the cancer will then develop at the site of the scar where that caustic injury occurred. plummer vinson syndrome typically has post-cricoid esophageal web and iron deficiency anemia, and about 10% of patients with plummer vinson syndrome can develop cancer in the upper third of the esophagus. Finally, let's take a quick overview of the TNM staging of esophageal cancer, where you'll notice that the T staging is based on the depth of tumor involvement and not with size, where T4 is invasion of surrounding structures and T1 is basically just on the muscularis mucosa of the esophagus. When it comes to lymph node involvement, you've got either a 0 or a 1, where any lymph node involvement immediately grades the cancer as a 2B or higher. And when it comes to metastases, as soon as there are any distant or non-regional lymph node mets involved, this patient immediately has a 4A or 4B cancer. I hope you enjoyed this quick 10-minute chat on an approach to dysphagia. And if you found it useful, please hit the like button and subscribe and share with others. Enjoy the rest of your day.